so happy and uh, I have, uh, to have the pleasure to present this presentation to you all. Uh, and thank you for the Saudi Autoradiology Society for having me. Uh, inshallah, you will enjoy today's presentation very much. Uh, today's presentation, I chose this topic because I'm really passionate about the parathyroid. I remember when I was an, uh, a student, I remember when I was a fifth year student, the first time I realized I wanted to specialize in autoradiology or go into EET because I attended one OR. I thought I was interested in general surgery, but I attended one OR of parathyroid. And actually, Dr. Arif was uh, the, the surgeon at that time. Uh, welcome, Dr. Arif. And I enjoyed that OR so much, so I decided uh, to go for EET. I also I liked all other aspects of EET, but specifically the parathyroid. For some reason, I liked it more than any other uh, gland in the, in the human body. So I chose this topic today because it's really rare. Uh, it's really interesting. There is heavy debate in the literature about this topic. I really enjoyed uh, preparing for today's presentation, and I hope, inshallah, you, all, all of you will enjoy it. Like, right. uh, first of all, I have one slide that I will talk about the basics of the parathyroid gland. Uh, now, the normal parathyroid gland usually weighs between 35 to 40 uh, gram a milligram, and it measures about 3 to 8 millimeters. This is the normal parathyroid functioning gland. And uh, the blood supply comes from the inferior thyroid artery, and uh, the superior parathyroid gland originates from the fourth uh, brachial branch, and the inferior one already originates from the third uh, brachial branch. About. And in, uh, the, nor uh, the disease that we all know, the primary, secondary, uh, and tertiary hyperparathyroidism, uh, have a very distinct uh, laboratory values, and you can diagnose them by just looking for the laboratory uh, values and also the clinical picture of the patient. Uh, today we will focus, inshallah, on the primary hyperparathyroidism and a very specific uh, type of primary hyperparathyroidism concept, which is the parathyroid carcinoma. Now, the epidemiology of parathyroid cancer, uh, it, it represents a very small uh, amount of patients who have uh, parathyroid, uh, who have uh, endocrine uh, uh, cancers, and from all cancers, it represents 0.005%, so it's really, really rare. Uh, and 1 to 5 percent of all cases with primary uh, hyperparathyroidism, so it's even there uh, as a cause of primary hyperparathyroidism. It usually metastasizes uh, locally regionally, or if it goes further, it goes into the fifth or the sixth uh, cervical uh, lymph nodes. Uh, and this is important in the surgical uh, approach we will discuss later on. And this uh, distant metastasis usually metastasizes to the lung. Uh, and 15 percent of those patients who have metastasis to the lung have also metastasis. Born. And the morbidity and mortality is actually not caused by the burden of the tumor itself, it's caused by the uh, metabolic complications of the high and high calcium level in those patients. Uh, now the risk factors in parathyroid carcinoma, it's not really agreed upon in the literature. However, most patients who have a diagnosis, a previous diagnosis of thyroid cancer, they might have parathyroid carcinoma. And there is even one uh, case report he made here in Saudi Arabia where one patient has simultaneously papillary thyroid cancer and parathyroid carcinoma at the same time. And also patients who were diagnosed with parathyroid adenoma might have parathyroid carcinoma, and that might be because of the genetic mutation in the CTC subjective regime. Familial isolated primary hyperparathyroidism can be another risk factor, and uh, it's a variant of men one. If a patient presents with a suspicious parathyroid gland, uh, those, uh, we had one patient uh, that presented with a, a very large parathyroid, around 4 cm, and they ordered a, a MRI of the pituitary because they were suspecting a men uh, one, and they wanted to rule that out. So it's really important to know that all these are risk factors for the parathyroid carcinoma. Now, uh, I want to present two cases, two lo local cases here uh, at Taif, that were diagnosed with parathyroid carcinoma. I will not go into details of those patients, I will just highlight the important facts about them. The first patient is a 58-year-old female. Uh, she's a known case of asthma and hypertension. Now, this patient had back pain for two years, and they wanted to investigate this severe back pain, so they ordered for her cervical MRI. In the cervical MRI, they found an incidental soft tissue density mass at the right lower baratracheal zone. This mass measured about 3.5 in 4.8 centimeters. It was huge. Uh, so her, uh, her, uh, her thyroid function was okay. 
Uh, now, this patient underwent after the cervical MRI, they ordered thyroid ultrasound. In the thyroid ultrasound, it confirmed the presence of this uh, mass. It was not identified initially as a parathyroid because it was new. So it was a mass, and FNA was done for this patient. And the FNA results came out as follicular neoplasm. So the direction went into a, 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 into a thyroid cancer before the OR. Now, in the OR, uh, it, it was done in the 17th of May in 2016. Uh, they excised uh, uh, the, the, the right thyroid globe, so they performed hemothyroidectomy, and they uh, took out the right inferior mass. And in the OR, they identified it to be a possible parathyroid adenoma. And they sent for frozen section. The frozen section confirmed it's a parathyroid uh, tissue. However, it, uh, it did not confirm it's malignant or benign in the frozen section. And uh, the surgeon performed level 6 in throat dissection. Uh, and then uh, the histopathology results came out as a parathyroid carcinoma uh, with the very uh, important histological features of this carcinoma, which is capsular and vascular and focus of tissue invasion. Uh, and the resection margin was 3, but it was very close uh, resection, uh, less than 0.1 centimeter. Other lymph node and thyroid was okay. Now this, this table will show you the pre and post operative uh, laboratory results of this patient. However, I, I highlighted the most important uh, laboratory values. The pre operative calcium was 3.06 and post operative it was 2.3. And the pre operative parathyroid hormone was 593. It went more than 50% after the resection to 148. And in, in, in follow up, it went to the normal gate after that. Now the alkaline phosphatase, I will, I will talk about it specifically in those patients. This is why I highlighted the alkaline phosphatase in this patient, even though it is normal. And then I calculated a specific measure, which is the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio. And we will discuss why this specific value is important in those patients. Now in follow-up, this patient actually is still alive today, alhamdulillah, uh, at six years and five months after the tumor reception. And she's following using the BTH and the calcium uh, values and thyroid ultrasound. And all of it was with it normal. Now the second case is a very young female lady, 30 years old, and she is medically free. Now this patient had a very special, special presentation. She did not have bone pain. She just had lower ventricular cessation, leg swelling for one year. She went to the ER multiple times and she told me, everyone told me, you are psychotic, you don't have any anything, you are okay, go home. And then one time they took her laboratory values and they found that the calcium was 2.7 and the BTH value was 185. So she was referred to the endocrinology clinic and there they performed thyroid ultrasound. Now as you can see, uh, they found in the thyroid, uh, in the left tube of the thyroid gland, a mass. This is about 2.7 and 0.7 centimeter in free inferior module. And actually, in this ultrasound, they reported this mass as a lymph node. Then uh, this patient underwent technician hysterectomy with SPECT CT, which highlighted uh, left sided uh, uh, increased radioactivity, suggesting that it is uh, a parathyroid gland uh, that is hyperactive. And then this patient underwent only left inferior uh, parathyroidectomy, and also was sent for frozen section to back as parathyroid tissue, uh, and then sent to the final histopathology, it came out as parathyroid carcinoma. Now, they panicked, they called the patient again, she came back, and they performed left hemothyroidectomy, and they just uh, excised the local regional lymph node. There was no uh, uh, level 5 or level 6 lymph node dissection in this, in this patient, uh, just uh, left, uh, left hemothyroidectomy. Again, this patient, this is the pre-operative and the post-operative values. Uh, as you can see, it was not as high as the previous patient. However, it is significantly high to cause symptoms. Uh, and again, I want to highlight that the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio of this patient was less than 4.1. And again, we will discuss uh, this the importance of this value later on in Shanghai. Again, this patient, alhamdulillah, is alive. Uh, five years and five, mo uh, uh, five months after the tumor resection, she is also following in the endocrinology clinic by the BTH calcium and thyroid uh, adversary. Now, after presenting those two patients, uh, I want to talk about the diagnostic dilemma of those uh, patients who have parathyroid cancer. Now, if I can summarize it into four categories, these are the four categories. The first thing is that there is no intraoperative or preoperative tool that can confirm the diagnosis of parathyroid cancer. 
it's usually uh, up to the certain uh, high index of suspicion to suspect if this patient has a parathyroid carcinoma or not, especially if the patient findings are not that severe. And the second thing is that it presents exactly like any primary hyperparathyroidism. So it's easier to assume it's an adenoma because it represents almost 85% of primary hyperparathyroidism. And the, uh, the most important thing about diagnosing those patients is that it changes the surgical approach. In those patients, it is important to have an extended surgical approach to prevent recurrence in the future. And the fourth thing is the difficulty of going into OR again after uh, removing, for instance, the second patient, only the parathyroid, and then going back for lift uh, thyroidectomy. That might uh, the surgeon might find a large scar tissue. Now, the in the literature, they have proposed a lot of uh, clinical prediction that can help surgeons diagnose uh, parathyroid carcinoma. The first thing is something called the less than three plus less than three rule. Now, they said that almost 80% of patients who have uh, parathyroid carcinoma have a, a, a diameter, the longest diameter of, this, uh, of the parathyroid is more than three centimeters. And the preoperative uh, calcium level is usually more than three, maybe more per liter. So if you have these two, you have to suspect that this patient has parathyroid carcinoma. Now, the American Joint Committee of Cancer, they, they mentioned that if this patient has a vulnerable ne uh, neck mass, and if it has a serum calcium level greater than 14 mg per deciliter, and uh, a BTH that is high, significantly high than usual patients of primary hyperparathyroidism, you have to also suspect parathyroid carcinoma. Now, I want to talk briefly about the BTH assay. Uh, as you all know that the BTH has a very short half-life, uh, and most patients, there is an overlap between the values of parathyroid carcinoma and primary hyperparathyroidism. So there is a BTH assay that can calculate the overall reduction of the gland of the parathyroid hormone, and it can help uh, the surgeon know how much this gland is producing before the half-life of this BTH uh, is done. Now, they found that a value of more than one uh, of this ratio can raise a uh, preoperative suspicion of the parathyroid cancer. Now, there is a secondary and tertiary uh, BTH assay, and this ratio is obtained by dividing the secondary uh, BTH assay over the tertiary uh, BTH assay. Now, this is a very, very nice di uh, diagnostic algorithm that can help in diagnosing those patients. So as, as we mentioned that the history of this patient, severe hyperplasmic teachers with less than three, uh, plus less than three rule, and if it's available in your center, the CDC, 73, and mid one uh, mutation analysis, and we will discuss why it's important to, uh, to perform this genetic analysis. If it's possible, uh, if, if any of these, either the history less than three, plus three rule, or even the genetic mutation is positive, you have to suspect that this patient has parathyroid carcinoma. Then you, you have to do the ultrasound of the thyroid gland, you have to do the BTH assay uh, ratio if it's more than one, and the molecular profiling is if available. And then the significance of this diagram is to perform oncology surgery, which is in block section of the whole tumor. Uh, now, there is a very interesting thing. If you find that this patient after his pathology had a parathyroid cancer, why it's important to perform the CDC uh, 73 and MEN1 mutation analysis? because it can affect the follow-up period. It, should it be closer? Are we suspecting recurrency sooner or not? This is why before the CDC uh, 73 or main one genetic analysis is important. Now, uh, if you remember in the first uh, two cases, I talked about the alkaline phosphatase. And I highlighted the alkaline phosphatase, although it was normal in both patients. There was a study published in 2012 uh, by Korean uh, scientists, they said that if a patient had less than 300, uh, the atlantis fatigue value was less than 300, this patient is likely to have a parathyroid carcinoma. However, in both of our patients, all of those patients had normal atlantis fatigue values. Then uh, we have the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio. Now, the lymphocyte and monocyte ratio was published very recently, in July 2022. They found that uh, if you combine a ratio of lymphocyte to monocyte of less than 4.8 with the longest diameter of the tumor of, less, uh, of more than two, uh, 28 millimeter, you will have a very high predictive power of the parathyroid carcinoma. This is really uh, revolutionary because 
it's really easy to obtain the, the thyroid ultrasound and the lymphocyte and monocyte ratio in any center. So you don't have to have a, a very expensive diagnostic method to, uh, to have a prediction in those patients. And actually, both of our patients, they had uh, a lymphocyte to monocyte ratio of less than 4.8. The first patient had uh, 3.6, and the second one had 1.7. And then we have the radiological assessment in those patients. Now, radiologically, it's really hard to find uh, or to predict that this patient had a, had, have a parathyroid carcinoma. And the thyroid ultrasound and CT scanning, they do not predict uh, the malignancy. And even the technetium, uh, technetium usually can miss even the metastatic uh, lesions in, in those patients. However, we have a few features that if you find it, it can raise your suspicions, like large mass, complex cystic lesions, or central necrosis and calcifications and also compression of any adjacent tissue. You can't suspect malignancy in that case, but it's, again, really hard to differentiate if this is a thyroid origin or a parathyroid origin. Laboratory values can help as well. However, you cannot rely solely on the radiologic assessment. Uh, now, FNA aspiration is contraindicated in patients with parathyroid carcinoma, especially if you are suspecting the, the, the parathyroid carcinoma diagnosis. But in the first patient, they thought this is a thyroid origin. And um, then you can use the FNA in one case, like in this report, the case report, uh, it systemically failed to, uh, to detect the metastasis. One patient, they found that he had parathyroid carcinoma, they resected the parathyroid carcinoma, year went on, and then this patient came back with high calcium level, had high PTH, and the system they could not find any metastasis. Uh, and they repeated this maybe multiple times, and they did a CT, an MRI, they did not find the origin of this metastasis. Only one lymph node was, was found in the uh, neck, and they did FNA, and they found that this is actually about the tissue, and they resected uh, this uh, mass. Uh, now, the surgical approach in those patients, as we mentioned, should be in block resection. And it can be curative if the, if the tumor is localized, it can cure those patients. Now, it's, this is why it's crucial to find a way to diagnose those patients before going into OR, or even it does not have to, to be before OR, it could be intraoperatively. If, if the surgeon suspected that this patient had a parathyroid carcinoma, he should, uh, or she should, the surgeon, they should opt for uh, in-block resection. And uh, again, frozen resection it does not give you an accurate uh, diagnosis of parathyroid carcinoma. You can see in this picture, uh, that the parathyroid carcinoma can appear firm and white and gray. This picture is not clear, but intraoperatively, uh, the evidence of invasion of adjacent tissue can give you a hint that this patient has parathyroid carcinoma. Now, th there is something that's really, really interesting, uh, which is the use uh, of near infrared autofluorescence in the uh, diagnosis intraoperatively. It can predict that if this patient has a parathyroid carcinoma or if it's a normal parathyroid tissue. They use the autofluorescence before to identify normal uh, parathyroid tissue, but they found out that if you know that this patient has a parathyroid mass, and then you uh, uh, you uh, perform the autofluorescence, you will realize that in the picture, you can see that there is no uptake of the autofluorescence uh, skin. However, in normal tissue, you can see that there is normal uptake of the autofluorescence skin. Uh, now, the uh, histopathological uh, examination after resection, uh, the evidence of vascular or pre-neural invasion is the cornerstone of diagnosing those uh, patients or those tumors. Uh, now, there is supportive findings. Sometimes there is no clear invasion. However, uh, the histopathologist can find uh, trabecular growth, mitotic figures, necrosis, or the presence of broad fibrous bands. All those features, they can uh, give you a hint that this patient have a parathyroid carcinoma, or sometimes they call it atypical parathyroid adenoma. Now, I just want to remind, uh, remind you of the level of evidence. If you are uh, going to uh, talk about any prognostic factors, any evidence, that is, these are the level of evidence. We will talk today about level one, which is evidence that comes from systematic uh, review or beta analysis, or any uh, relevant um, control trials. And level three, which is by well designed control tri trial, but without randomization. Now, uh, there is prognostic factors that only three prognostic factors that are known to uh, influence the prognosis in, this, in those patients. The first prognostic factor is older age. 
Now, at the, the initial diagnosis, if this patient is an elderly, they found out that it affects their overall survival in those patients. They, of course, have uh, overall worse survival. And the second thing is gender. They found that men had a worse, worse prognosis and also a higher probability of uh, metastasis later on. And the only uh, one prognostic factor that all literature agreed upon is the distance metastasis. It is predictive of the overall uh, worse survival in those patients. Now, you can see in this cancer-specific survival uh, figure that uh, the, the red line represents distant patients with distant metastasis. Now, we have 15 patients. Those patients did not pass 10 years after their diagnosis. So, uh, and those patients in the, in the blue line, they represent patients who had a cancer that is localized to the neck, and they lived up to 20 years, most of them. Now, uh, these factors, all these factors, they are prognostic factors. However, there is no agreed upon literature that finds these, these uh, prognostic factors either good or bad in the prognosis. And you might think that if this patient had a very high preoperative calcium or very high DTH, it might affect the prognosis because it will affect other organs, the kidney, the bones. However, it does not affect the prognosis in those patients. And even the lymphovascular invasion, they found that even if those patients have lymphovascular invasion, they are not sure if it affects the prognosis or not after active intersection. Uh, and also the, the, the access of the tumor. However, most recent research, they tend to agree that if the tumor is more than four centimeters, the prognosis is bad. Now, uh, there is one uh, important prognostic factor uh, for histopathologists, which is the barafibromin uh, stain. Now, this part of barafibromin stain can stain both benign and malignant uh, tumor. Now, if they stain the malignant tumor and they found that the stain is not uh, is negative, like in uh, figure A, it predicts worse prognosis, and usually those patients who have uh, a negative stain, a negative barafibromin stain, they require more close blood. Now, the recurrence, usually the local and the distant uh, recurrence, they happen with the same percentage in, in all patients. And as we mentioned in the beginning, distant meta uh, metastasis usually happen in the lung and in the bone. Now, we have uh, certain factors that are associated with the recurrence and the cancer specific, thing, like lymph node metastasis at the time of the diagnosis, development of distant uh, metastasis during the follow up. And also the tumor character, if it's characterized pathologically by necrosis, it will also affect the prognosis. Staging. Staging also is not agreed like upon. There is only one recommendation in the staging. Now, why there is, most certain they do not believe in, in staging in the barothyroid carcinoma? The first thing is because it's a very rare malignancy. The second thing, the tumor size and the lymph node metastasis, which is the corner sort of the staging does not or have, has not been proven to create with the survival in those patients. And it's really diagnosed preoperative. So you are using the staging before you go into OR. However, most of those patients are not recognized until the final histopathology. Now, the American Joint uh, Committee of Cancer, they uh, published a recommendation in their eighth edition in 2017. And in this rec recommendation, they published a staging. In this staging, it's a normal team and staging. And they, uh, TX means that it's, uh, the, the, the primary tumor cannot be assessed. Zero, there is no evidence of the primary tumor. TIS, it's an atypical parathyroid neoplasm. As we mentioned, histopathologically, there is no uh, different diagnosis of parathyroid cancer. T1, localized to the parathyroid gland, with extension only to the uh, soft tissue. And T2, only invasion to the thyroid. T3, there is invasion to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Esophagus, trachea, skin, and muscle adjacent to the of thymus, and T4 that is direct invasion to the blood, uh, blood vessel or the spine. And the uh, lymph node um, N criteria, NX means that the regional lymph node cannot be assessed. N0, there is no regional lymph node found. N1, regional lymph node metastasis only. N1A means only level 6 and 7. N1B means 1, 2, level 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 either unilaterally or in the other side, uh, uh, in the uh, contralateral side. M criteria, M0, there is no distant metastasis. M1, there is distant metastasis. So it's a basic uh, T and M staging. However, it does not uh, reflect the prognosis of those patients. Now, uh, there are three interesting uh, 
uh, articles that I would like to show you, they contradicted or they are uh, trying to discuss the, uh, this TNM sneaking. Like this very recently published um, research that was uh, made by Korean uh, researcher, they found that T1, which is invasion to the soft tissue, or T2, which is invasion to the thyroid, does not affect uh, the prognosis negatively, especially in patients who do not have any lymph node or distal metastasis. But they found that once the tumor reaches up to 4 cm, regardless of the invasion, this patient has a worse prognosis. Now, another uh, a study that was done in Germany in February 2022, they found that low T stage or N0 stage during the diagnosis and the remission, post -operatively, uh, the remission of the post-operative biochemical values, they uh, guarantee a uh, recurrency free survival. So they agree with the TNM staging that it affects the prognosis uh, positively if the staging is low. And uh, one study that was published in 2015 before the staging, uh, they found that, that the patients who have a positive node state did not have a high risk of death. So if you find a patient who had uh, nodal uh, metastasis and he was diagnosed or she was diagnosed with bar thyroid carcinoma, it does not for sure affect the prognosis value. Now here, uh, I did a literature review of all Saudi uh, published uh, case reports, any research about the parathyroid carcinoma. And this is everything that was uh, indexed in either scholar, government. We only have few case reports and a few articles, and they do not go in depth into the clinical features of those patients. So we are really in need of um, collecting all patients who have parathyroid carcinoma or were diagnosed with parathyroid carcinoma in Saudi Arabia to know what's the incidence of parathyroid carcinoma in Saudi Arabia. Now, there is one website that I like so much, which is parathyroid.com. It is monitored by the Norman Parathyroid Center, which is a specialized center of, of parathyroid surgery. And it has all the information, uh, if any of you are interested in the parathyroid uh, surgery, uh, it has a lot of videos and pictures and anatomy figures. It's, uh, it's an amazing website. Now, uh, the take home message of today's presentation is the first thing, you have to try your best to diagnose those patients before OR because it will change the surgical approach. The second thing, if you find that the, the, the calcium level is more than 3 or more, uh, millimole per liter or more than 14 milligrams per deciliter according to your laboratory unit, or the tumor size is more than 4 cm, or there is a palpable neck mass, that should raise your suspicion of diagnosing parathyroid carcinoma. The second thing that I highlighted in green are the areas that need more research. The first thing is um, other prognostic factors that I highlighted that does not have any um, evidence of their affection of prognosis, they need more research. And also the uh, American Joint Committee has a TNM staging. It has to be uh, researched for if it, does, if it affects the prognosis or not. And thank you so much for listening. If you want to see the references, you can scan this code. And also I have one uh, Telegram group where I try to publish all, um, all events of ET or available books for free, anything. If you want to join my Telegram channel, it's public. Uh, thank you so much for listening and for attending today. It was a pleasure uh, to present to you all. Thank you.